Thanks, Davina. You have such a hard act to follow and then you put up a puppy. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so thank you and um, thanks very much to um, the organisers and ACTA for the invitation. It's really great to be here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about informing decisions and Cochrane's approach to implementation or uh, I'll say this up front to forgive me if I mix up my terms. Uh, Cochrane talks about it in terms of knowledge translation but uh, hopefully you'll forgive me if I uh, use the terms a little bit interchangeably, although I'll define them in a moment. Uh, my disclosure of interests you can have a look at yourself. You'll see from this that when it comes to this particular topic, I'm at pretty high risk of bias. So I um, need to declare that before we start. There we go, great. Um, this is a, a commonly used way to frame uh, what we've come to think of as the evidence practice policy gap and it, it comes from the WHO past director, John Wook Lee. Um, it remains, it's, it's quite old but it remains one of my favourite quotes around making the case for the importance of, of research translation and understanding the gap between evidence and practice uh, and in particular when he said that action without knowledge is wasted effort just as knowledge without action is wasted resource. But a somewhat more contemporary way, um, equally valid, of, of looking at the need for research translation or implementation, looking at our evidence to practice and policy gap, is to frame it uh, in the way that Davina just did around the, the concept of, of re wasting research um, and the Lancet series that she mentioned. Because if we fail to get the results of our research trials or any other research into policy and practice, then in fact it is a form of waste and I think um, could be added to these, these four important sources of waste as documented in The Lancet. So that said, thinking about the importance of research, research translation, I think it, it's useful, although potentially somewhat dry, to, to think about the definitions. I think there are a lot of terms that, that get thrown around, implementation, research translation, knowledge translation knowledge translation and exchange, translation of research into policy and practice, TRIP, uh, multiple terms that, that are essentially meaning the same thing. But I thought it might be helpful for, uh, for you to, to reflect on, I guess, some of the ways that I think about it after thinking quite a lot and talking quite to a lot of people in this space. So this is my favourite formal definition. Again, I am at quite high risk of bias. This is Jeremy's definition. Um, from implementation science in 2012. But there's a reason why this is my favourite, not just because it's from my friend, and that's because it really emphasises that two-way approach uh, of knowledge translation and the approach that we should be taking, thinking not just about pushing out the results of our research, but also thinking about growing capacity and working with our users uh, around pulling that research back. So. Um, ensuring that our stakeholders or our users are aware of and use our research evidence to inform their health and healthcare decision making. Uh, and the stakeholders bit I've added onto the slide, these are, are what I think of as the users of my research. Uh, you'll see them reflected in the ACTA document that you have, um, which is nice for me that it's shared and certainly uh, the stakeholders as, as articulated by Cochrane. So this is a, a formal articulate you know, lovely way of thinking about research translation. I'm, um, I'm a little bit more simple and practical than this. So this is my working way of thinking about what I mean when I talk about implementation or research translation. And that is, first of all, knowing what we need to know and then knowing what we should be doing and then doing what we know we should be doing <coughs> in that stepped approach. So if we break that up, I'm going to sort of thread that through um, the rest of the talk to, to think about, I, I know it's not linear, I think it's really important to say that up front, but, but for clarity, this is the way that I like to think about it. So we've talked about that in terms of, of being implementation or research translation or knowledge translation. Uh, the other term that you'll hear a lot is implementation science or knowledge translation research. Um, and the definition of that comes from Martin Eccles, also from implementation science, that it's the scientific study of the methods to promote the systematic uptake of clinical research findings and other evidence-based practices into practice and policy, and hence to improve the quality of care. So it involves the study of the determinants, the processes and the outcomes of implementation, researching how we do this better. So in my framework, it's really the bit that's about 
know, moving from knowing what we should be doing to doing what we know we should be doing. And if you'll forgive me sounding a little bit like Dr. Seuss, I think about it as knowing how to get people to do what we know they should be doing. <laughs> okay, so that said, what's Cochrane's approach? Uh, Cochrane, as I hope many of you will know, I, I have many Cochrane colleagues in the audience, so I think we're a bit stacked, but Cochrane is uh, an international organisation and our vision is a world of improved health where decisions about health and healthcare are informed by high quality, relevant and up-to-date synthesised research evidence. Now, that's been our vision since the late 1990s. We did a refresh of our mission statement and our strategic plan uh, reasonably recently, but, but elected not to change the vision. And that's important because Cochrane is first and foremost a systematic review producer. But in our vision statement right from the beginning has been that systematic reviews need to inform decisions. And, um, and I hope you'll, uh, you'll agree with me that that can't be done without a real lens on knowledge translation or implementation. So what's the role of Cochrane in, in KT? We, we have always done this. We've always had what I think of as, as sort of three key jobs to do around the knowledge translation space. And the, the first one is in generating the content for knowledge translation or the knowledge to knowledge translation. And that's the knowing what we need to do. So that's doing, um, sorry, the knowing what we need to know. So that is doing reviews that meet the needs of our users, doing our high priority reviews, doing the reviews that answer the questions that need to be answered. And then in doing those reviews, we're generating or producing the reliable evidence. So setting the direction for what we should be doing. We have also always done systematic reviews of um, the evidence for implementation science. So the knowing how to get people to do what we know we should be doing. So systematic reviews around the how to implement. What we probably haven't always done well is linking that up in a coordinated way. And we haven't always given a lot of thought to the, the doing what we know we should be doing or to facilitating the implementation. So we've produced the reviews, we've produced reviews about how to implement, but we haven't necessarily thought too much about, about how we can support our users in ensuring that our evidence is used. So this is a new, relatively new piece of work for Cochrane. It's a really significant investment over the past uh, 12 months to two years to generate a new knowledge translation, generate and implement a new knowledge translation framework. And this is a framework to guide our knowledge translation work. It's available on the Cochrane website. Uh, and it really lays out a, a quite a large work program for the coming two to three years about initiatives that we're going to put in place to try and make it easier for people to use Cochrane reviews. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that for the rest of the talk. In the framework, we've articulated our four key audiences for Cochrane and they match uh, exactly with those that have been spoken about already today, consumers and the public, practitioners, policymakers and healthcare managers and researchers and research funders. Uh, missing from there, people often ask me, are the media, guideline developers, they are still considered by Cochrane to be incredibly important partners and audiences, but we're seeing them as channels to our ultimate audiences. So for example, guideline developers as channels to clinicians, media as channels to all of us. <coughs> Excuse me, included in the, or, or laid out in the framework, the body of the framework is around these six key Cochrane themes. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time today talking about the organisational piece, but um, instead sort of take these themes as a structure for how we might think about the implementation of research in general, not just Cochrane's, um, not just Cochrane's implementation approach. So this is the, you will have seen this already, you'll recognise this is Jeremy's, oh, no it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, now, this is Jeremy's, he's <laughs> seen a blank page already. Uh, this is Jeremy's um, excellent simple framework, I think you called it, did you call it a simple framework? Very simple framework um, of implementation, moving from trials to systematic reviews, policy change, service development and clinical care. Um, what, I've, what I've done and, and tried to think about over the past uh, couple of days in, in putting this talk together is, is how to bring together all of these, you know, there's a million frameworks, uh, um, 
colleague of, of mine who helped in putting together the, the Cochrane KP framework said that frameworks are like toothbrushes. Nobody wants to use anybody else's. Um, and I think it's really true. So what I've tried to do is um, pull together some of the frameworks into kind of a cohesive piece to try and get some clarity around uh, what we're talking about. And so taking my, Jeremy's is a simple framework, mine's an incredibly simple framework, but thinking about that and how it lines up across this process. So before we even start, before we start the trials or the reviews, we need to do the piece that's around knowing what we need to know. The, the trials and the systematic reviews provide us the knowing what we should be doing. And then the piece that comes after that, which is the, the implementation science piece, is doing what we know we should be doing. So Cochrane's themes fit in like this. A key and primary, probably the first piece of, piece of work is around how we facilitate exchange between all of the people working in this area, between the trialists, between the systematic review producers, and most importantly with our users. How we prioritise and co-produce our trials and our systematic reviews, and that work starts a long way before. There's a large plank of work for Cochrane around products and, and push. How do we present our reviews in ways that are a little less boring, a little bit easier to read, um, and a little bit more relevant for our end users? But equally, there's a piece of work around facilitating pull. How do we grow capacity in the users of our research to understand research? How do we contribute to research literacy? Uh, how do we work with them to make sure that they want to use our, our reviews? Uh, and then a piece of work for all of us in the sector around improving climate and building demand, never more important than at the moment. Um, we need to say science is not fake. So thinking about those, knowing what we need to know, the prioritisation and co-production piece. Um, for Cochrane, it's around producing evidence which meets the needs of our stakeholders. We're working on strengthening processes to identify <coughs> and prioritise our important reviews. You could substitute trials for reviews there. Uh, and working with our partners to produce and share reviews in a co-production model. These are just a couple of quick examples. I'm not going to dwell on them from some Australian-based Cochrane groups, uh, many of whom overlap with their, with their trials networks, uh, sit in the same place and with the same people. Cochrane Kidney and Transplant uh, really were early adopters of this. It's a really important priority setting exercise that they did around their reviews. Uh, Cochrane Consumers and Communications have published a, a lovely three-step process um, and new to um, a new contribution and, and really fabulous one, I am biased, I'm on their executive, another high risk of bias and Rochelle's in the audience, is um, the ANS, new ANSMUX approach around developing a priority setting tool which I would really recommend to you. Um, this slide is just to remind me that there is an, uh, an ACTA reference group or an ACTA working group working around research prioritisation. I'm sure some, some of you will be in the audience. So um, very terrific to see uh, an emphasis on that in, um, in within these networks as well. Okay, so that's the knowing what we need to know. Now what about the knowing what we should be doing? Um, Jeremy kindly has done a bit of my work for me here in, in making the case for systematic reviews, but I do just want to send, spend a minute just reflecting on the knowledge for knowledge translation. And of course, with my bias declared, um, I would say that that is research synthesis and not single studies. But there, there's empirical reason for that. And that's because we know that the results of individual studies uh, may change over time and usually lessen. And that comes from this landmark paper by John Iamides, who published in the JAMA an excellent piece of research on research, where he took uh, many of the really highly cited clinical research papers from, the, from four really important journals, I think JAMA, New England, Lancet and BMJ, and he tracked them over time to see what those recommendations or those results would show. Um, and of those 49 highly cited studies, 45 claimed that the intervention was effective. Seven later went on to be contradicted by subsequent studies. Seven found stronger effects than subsequent studies and the rest were either replicated or remained largely unchallenged. And to drill down in that a little bit, um, for the non-randomised studies, five of the six either were contradicted or showed weaker effects. But also for the trials, less so. 
but nine of the 39 went on to be contradicted. Okay, so that's what we should be translated. Now thinking about doing what we know we should be doing. And I just want to uh, get a little bit operational here and take, um, take you through our approach to how we design strategies for implementing research into practice or policy. Uh, and this comes from a publication from um, my colleague Simon French um, out of my group, includes Jeremy and Rochelle. And we, um, we took a lot of the frameworks and the theoretical approaches and tried to sort of drill it down into a, a bit of a, a practical guide. So the first step is thinking about who needs to do what differently in behavioural terms. Um, and I think Jeremy and Andrew both reflected on the importance about thinking about your results in terms of what the impact will be across all of the actors in the healthcare system, all of the behaviours that need to change. You need to be really clear about the change you want to bring about and think about it in terms of who needs to do what differently, when and how and where. The second step is to think about using a theoretical framework. Uh, and I won't spend much time on this, but, but much of the work in this area really comes from the psychological theory and thinking about changing the behaviours of our clinician colleagues and policymaking colleagues as you would change the behaviour of any human being. And there's really much that we can learn from theoretical behavioural theory in thinking about how we implement our research. This is one theory or theoretical framework. It's the one that I prefer and it's certainly been validated in healthcare workers. It comes from Susan Mickey and her colleagues uh, and it's called the Theoretical Domains Framework. It looks like this and I, um, I used to be a physiotherapist, so I have a clinical background. And when I first saw this, I could really recognise myself in it. These are the constructs within the theoretical domains framework that, that Susan and her colleagues have put forward as driving the behaviour of healthcare workers. So I'm not going to go through them all, but if you look at them, it's things like, you know, do I know about it? Can I do it? Do I have the skills? What do my peers do? How do I feel about it? Is it my role or somebody else's role? What will the consequences for the patient be? So thinking about that in a really structured way will then allow us to think about which intervention components could help to overcome the barriers and enhance the enablers. So if we can bring some structure to how we think about the, behave, the um, barriers and enablers through using this framework, we can think about designing interventions that are targeting them. We can also learn from the evidence, and I mentioned before that Cochrane has always generated systematic reviews of various strategies to change behaviour, and they come from the Effective Practice and Organisational Care Group, which Jeremy used to lead. Um, and at the risk of depressing everybody, <coughs> I thought I might just show you a quick summary of the results. So not depressing in terms of the numbers, but, but depressing potentially in terms of the effect size. So audit and feedback, commonly used intervention. There are 140 randomised control trials. I think more now, Jeremy, aren't they, in the most recent? Yeah, yeah. Double that. Um, do, it does work. It changes clinical behaviour. The effect size, while apparently fairly small, if you roll that out across the kinds of changes that you're trying to introduce, can have significant impact. So I just want to finish by by talking through how to pull all of that together in terms of thinking about designing your strategy. And I, I recognise because of time that this may be a little bit simplistic, but just by way of example, to talk a little bit about one of the, the studies that we did, which was looking at trying to reduce the number of plain x-rays that people in primary care were measuring for simple low back pain. So no red flags, no reason to x-ray, uh, trying to, to reduce that. And, and we did a a big study that looked at this and thought about the factors that needed to change and one of the many that were identified were the knowledge, didn't know that they needed to do it. Techniques that were theorised after looking at the barriers and enablers, sorry, didn't know that they didn't need to do it. Um, techniques that were theorised to, to think about altering or, or redirecting these factors from both the theory and the evidence was simply to think about instruction on how to perform the behaviour. But if we bring a theoretical domains framework lens to it and the evidence from our epoch reviews, we can think about 
not just instruction on how to inform the behaviour, but who should be giving that instruction. So if there's a belief about consequences or role, then maybe that would be better coming from a local opinion leader. If it simply is just a knowledge gap with no problems about beliefs or intention, then maybe printed materials or an educator can lead them. And then finally, how can behaviour change be measured and understood? Always thinking about, once we're implementing or trying to get our research into practice, did it work? What strategy did I use so that we're, we're building the evidence base around implementation science? So back to my original framework, knowing what we need to know, knowing what we should be doing, doing what we know we should be doing, and then knowing that we are doing what we know we should be doing. <laughs> Thank you.